Hello there! Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, the channel where we cover the complete history of the Asia-Pacific War from 1937 to 1945. <laughs> We are currently looking at the major historical events that led up to the Pacific War, and today's episode is on the disastrous situation that led to the First Opium War of 1839 to 1842. So if you're not already subscribed and or left a like, please do so as this bird does cost a lot of seeds as you can see. What were the Opium Wars? As you will learn during this episode, they were two wars fought between China, Britain, and then later on, France was also involved in the second one. The major reason for the wars was the illicit opium trade that was being forced upon China by Britain mainly. Why does this have any relevance on the Pacific War? The Opium Wars are the first real example of when Western forces disrupted Asia at a significant level. The Opium Wars left China weak and divided, a perfect piece of cake to cut from for all the Western powers, and most importantly, Japan, who would take advantage of this later on. But now, let's get to why this all occurred. Significant maritime trade between Europe and China can be linked back to 1557, when Portugal leased an outpost in Macau from the Ming Dynasty. This led to other European nations following their lead, one of which being the British Empire. The British began to appear around Chinese coasts sporadically from 1635 onwards. Now, historically, China was always fearful of outside destabilizing influences, and as a result, they had a rigid trade network known as the Chinese Tributary System. The Chinese Tributary System was a loose international relations network used predominantly by Japan and Korea prior to significant European involvement. The system required kowtowing to the emperor, like such, even lower actually, uh, to acknowledge his superiority and that of China over all other nations. This was a tribute system with the intent to establish China as a superior nation who would overwhelm the other nations, making them unequal. The system also only allowed trade to take place in select ports, such as Zhuzhan, Jiamen, and Canton. After the Ming Dynasty fell to the Qing Dynasty, the tribute system became the Canton system. Relatively the same, however, now it was only limited to the port of Canton, and Westerners had to do business through a Chinese merchant guild known as the Guang. Now, the reason why Westerners, and particularly the British, wanted desperately to trade with China was for its goods, those being porcelain, silk, and most importantly, tea. The only currency allowed to pay for these goods in China was silver. Now, Britain had a slight problem. It had begun importing tea at an exponential rate, starting in the mid-17th century. Where did Britain get the vast majority of its tea? Well, China, of course. Britain eventually became economically dependent on China for tea to sell to its citizens. You may think this is a simple issue, but the British population literally was addicted to the mild stimulant. Now, as you can imagine, in a situation where you can only buy Chinese tea with silver, Britain soon ran out of silver, and there was a trade deficit with China. This had gone on for over a century. Between 1710 and 1759, the imbalance was draining British silver, 26 million going into China and only about 9 million coming out. On top of this growing deficit, Britain lost the American Revolutionary War. The war debts and the loss of the colony bankrupt Britain, and the silver had finally run out. With no silver to pay the Chinese, how was Britain going to get its tea fix? Here comes Mr. Opium. Opium had been around for hundreds of years and was usually used in a dry powder form, drank with tea for medicinal purposes. Opium was cultivated mostly in India, and India was being dominated by the East India Company since 1612. Britain occupied Java after the Napoleonic Wars and became the primary traders in opium, 
It was at this point Britain merchants realized they could reduce the overwhelming trade deficit with China by selling opium to the Chinese for silver to then pay for goods such as tea. Problem solved? Here comes the opium trade boom. Though it had been around forever, the East India Company pushed it to new limits. Initially, the Qing Dynasty tolerated the opium importation increase because the silver was going to the British, was still being spent on Chinese goods, and China remained in a surplus. However, the opium usage began to visibly affect Chinese society, and the trade surplus was soon turning into a deficit for the Chinese. This led the Qing government to place an edict against opium in 1780 and an outright ban by 1796. Ironically, the tea-addicted Brits had just gotten the Chinese addicted to opium. We now begin with a few stories of how people led China and Britain to war. So let's start with Sir McCartney. So in 1792, Viscount McCartney was sent to China under orders from King George III to establish a British embassy in the capital, and to get permission for British ships to dock at ports beside Canton. Canton at this point had become overcrowded and was a complete bottleneck. The British were so eager to open up China, McCartney even was given instructions to offer the end of the opium trade, to sweeten the deal. Our friend McCartney entered Canton with a large amount of gifts for the Emperor and pleaded with the Quahog to allow him to go to the capital and have an audience with the Emperor. McCartney is brought all the way to the Emperor's summer palace in Jaul with 600 gifts requiring 90 wagons, 40 wheelbarrows, 200 horses, and 3,000 native laborers to bring it all. Wow. These gifts were telescopes, howitzers, globes, musical instruments, carriages, and even a hot air balloon complete with a balloonist to operate it. Imagine that. I wonder what this situation was like for that guy. He was just going to be stuck in China for the rest of his life. Now here's where we get into some trouble. The Qilong Emperor expected all of these gifts to be tribute because McCartney was a barbarian. The Chinese even nailed a sign to McCartney's ship reading, Tribute from the Red Barbarians. McCartney, on the other hand, believed he was bringing gifts from one sovereign nation to another. The Emperor also refused to meet McCartney inside the palace itself. Instead, he would meet in a horse-haired yurt outside the palace, which was used as a hunting lodge. This was done on purpose to snub McCartney and uh, any chance of him being seen as an equal. Now comes the issue of cow towing. Cow towing was the practice of bowing, kneeling, and then placing one's forehead on the floor nine times in front of the emperor, as all tributaries had done for centuries. So the Chinese immediately demanded McCartney kowtow to the emperor, which he begrudgingly was willing to do for the sake of the mission, but on one condition. Believing to be the bearer of the proudest and most powerful nation on earth, McCartney demanded the Mandarin courtiers of the same rank to him to kowtow to a life-size portrait of King George III that he conveniently brought with him. Imagine that. The Mandarins laughed at this outright because they believed they were the bearers of the proudest and most powerful nation on earth, and you, you see where this is kind of going. In the end, McCartney failed, and he left China empty-handed, to which he compared the emperor, uh, the empire, excuse me, to an old, crazy, first-rate man-of-war which a fortunate succession of able and vigilant officers had contrived to keep afloat. On top of this, the Emperor sent a letter to King George III stating China required nothing of Britain because it had everything. The strange and costly objects that they sent were of no interest to him and they were of no value. The Chinese had no use for British manufacturers. This was rather harsh, don't you think? Um, did the hot air balloonist have to stay in China or did they let him go? I could not find any information on this poor fellow. Now, while opium was officially illegal in China, it was still being smuggled in by the East India Company, who held a royal charter in trade for China. The British didn't want to either bankrupt or run the Chinese noses in the illicit trade. Britain had a fine-tuned equilibrium with the trade, which was working in their favor. Then, a technological innovation in Britain upset this equilibrium. You see, the invention of the steam engine resulted in the mechanized production of cotton by factories in northern England, 
Soon, the market flooded with mass-produced textiles whose surplus found a ready market in India and whose merchants paid cash, not silver. To pay for the ever-increasing amount of cotton, the Indians needed to cultivate and sell more opium. As a result, opium flooded into China and its distribution was bottlenecked all in Canton. Here comes our friend, Mr. William Pitt Amherst. Amherst was given the same task as McCartney in 1816 to meet with the new emperor of China, Jiangqing. Amherst was also given the advice to not kowtow to the emperor by King George III himself because this would result in another tributary relationship. Seeing the problem immediately, the Mandarin courtiers thought up a way to save face for both parties. They volunteered to clear the emperor's throne room and have Amherst kowtow to the emperor's empty chair. Amherst agreed to bow and to genuflect, but refused to put his face on the floor. That scared me. And especially not nine times. The courtiers then made a rather hilarious plan. They woke Amherst in the middle of the night and quickly brought him to the throne room, half asleep. They thought he would be so disoriented and tired to resist the kowtowing. A Mandarin courtier even tried to shove Amherst in an attempt to make him put his face on the floor, but Amherst's trusty assistant, Stanton, grabbed him by the elbow, catching him before he could fall. In the end, Amherst left China without even seeing the emperor, and this was humiliating. So now in 1833, a reform-minded British parliament abolished the East India Company's monopoly in China. This left China open to all British comers, and within a year, the amount of tea imported to Britain quadrupled. The trade in opium to pay for all this tea in 1830 was 18,000 chests. By 1833, it went up to 30,000 chests. Imagine that. A large reason for the increase in demand was the innovation in China's use of the drug. Typically, opium had been swallowed in a beverage form. Then, in the 18th century, the Chinese began smoking it. Opium affected China dramatically. Not only was draining silver out of China, but many Chinese across the socioeconomic ladder were laying off work to smoke up. Shopkeepers, servants, soldiers, and even Taoist priests were drifting into a week-long escapade, uh, smoking opium in a hut. So after the East India monopoly ended, the British realized they required a representative to be a Taipan or chief executive in Canton to control and conduct this trade. The first chief superintendent was Lord Napier, who arrived in Macau in 1834. Napier was a tall, thin, gangly, red-haired man. Unfortunately, Napier's physical appearance was in line with China's comical stereotype of the red-haired barbarian. Napier's orders were to protect British trade. Protect British trade, excuse me open up more Chinese ports to British merchants, and yet again to establish an official presence in the emperor's court. Napier was also explicitly told not to do anything in regards to the illicit opium business, strictly hands-off policy. Napier had a rude reception, to say the least, arriving into Canton. The viceroy basically gave him the cold shoulder. Now, at this point in time, there were European factories in Canton. These were living quarters and the business quarters for Westerners. Now, after some rocky engagements with the viceroy of Canton named Lu Kun, there came some problems. Lu Kun became annoyed at Napier's arrogant behavior, I mean, he was British after all, and ordered him to leave Canton and return to Macau. To further the point, Lu Kun also halted all trade with Britain until Napier left pretty rude. Now, Lu Kun's edicts actually delighted some British merchants, who now believed that some sort of intervention by the British government may occur to aid their pockets. The largest and most influential trading companies in Canton, Jardin and Matheson, took this opportunity to urge Napier to retaliate for Lu Kun's atrocious behavior. Napier took this advice and sent a letter back to England urging that force be used against China. His letter read, Three or four frigates and brigs with a steady few British troops would settle this thing. The exploit is to be performed with a facility 
unknown even in the capture of paltry West Indian islands. So on August 16, 1834, the Viceroy of Canton enacted a partial embargo on British imports, leading Napier to write another letter to Britain calling for military intervention. Napier's letter read, What can an army of bows and arrows and pikes and shield do against a handful of British veterans? Meanwhile, Napier decided to bypass Lucan and make his case directly to the residents of Canton, arguing they would be hurt by the trade embargo with Britain. This enraged Lucun, as you can imagine, who threatened to embargo all British trade permanently and force all British residents out of Canton. Chinese soldiers began to surround the factory with the residents inside. Napier ordered three frigates, Andromache, Omojin, and Louisa, to come to Canton, which was guarded by two bogey forts. Napier knew the Chinese would attack the ships and ordered Captain Blackwood to fire back and destroy the fort's cannons. When the British ships came, the bogey's 60 cannons began to fire, completely shooting overhead of the British ships. You see, the cannons they were using were very outdated, and they were bolted literally to the ground, incapable of aiming properly. Jack Beechin said of the event, they were more like fireworks than piece of ordnance. The frigates sailed past the forts, destroying the bogey cannons, uh, while Charles Elliot, captain of Louisa, sat in a chair, sunbathing on deck as it occurred. Only two British sailors were killed during what became known as the Battle of the Bogue. But outright war was averted because Napier got very ill and had to leave. That's really convenient. The Duke of Wellington... As a result, canned Napier and replaced him with John Francis Davis, who immediately refused the terrible job when he figured out what, was, what it was going to be like. Then our sunbathing captain friend, Captain Charles Elliott, was appointed Chief Superintendent of Trade in June 1836. Foreign Minister Lord Palmerston ordered Elliot to make sure tea continued to be safely shipped out of China and into the teacups of English drawing rooms for the ritual afternoon tea. The opium trade was to be ignored as it was paying for the tea. So on November 1836, the Daozhong Emperor banned the importation and use of opium in China as it was in a full crisis. The number of Chinese addicts at the time Elliot took office was estimated between 4 to 12 million Chinese. The Viceroy of Canton during all of this completely ignored the business as he was corrupt and instead brutalized the local Chinese merchants instead of attacking the British. That must have pleased the Chinese very much. Thus, in 1838, Zhao Daozhong sent, and I apologize again, I hope I'm pronouncing these right, Lin Jiazhu, the governor of Hubei and Hunan to take on the crisis. Lin Jiaxu had an impeccable reputation, having suppressed the opium trade in Hubei and Hunan provinces prior. Nicknamed Blue Sky because it was said that he was as pure as an unblemished and cloudless sky. It's actually quite beautiful. High Commissioner Lin Jiaxu sent a memorandum to the emperor complaining that Chinese customers spent over 100 million tails of silver and opium, while the entire Chinese government budget was only 40 million tails. He warned, If we continue to allow this trade to flourish, in a few dozen years, we will find ourselves not only with no soldiers to resist the enemy, but also with no money to equip the army. So Lin first sent a letter to Queen Victoria, appealing to her morality and sense of justice to stop the illicit trade. The letter probably never even got to her. Regardless, there was no response. Interesting fact, Lynn's personal translator was named Peter Parker. I have no reason to say anything about this. I just thought it was kind of silly and funny that you know Peter Parker was the name of the person. Lynn, in frustration, spoke to the emperor, who accepted his evaluation of the situation and enacted draconian edicts. Opium addicts would be given 18 months to surrender their drugs to escape punishment. Foreigners who engaged in the trade would be beheaded, Chinese dealers strangled, and even corrupt officials who took bribes for the trade would be put also to death. By spring 1839, the first opium war began. 
1,600 residents of Canton, from dealers to users to dishonest bureaucrats, were arrested and over 3,000 chests of opium were confiscated. Lin knew this was just a mere fraction of the chests lying around and stepped up the threats. By surrounding the factories with Chinese soldiers demanding that chests all be handed over. Elliot found out about this and he acted. He ordered all British ships docked in Canton to get to the relative safety of Hong Kong while he would go to the factories himself. Elliot met with everyone stuck in Canton and counseled a strategy. He would try to secure passports for the refugees but was not optimistic and admitted that a failure to secure safe passage out of Canton would turn the situation into a hostage crisis. On March 28th, 1839, the soldiers surrounding the factories turned it into a real siege, sealing off the area's streets. They banged huge gongs to the sleep-deprived inhabitants, forbid food, and only allowed in two buckets of water. They nailed giant placards to the walls demanding all opium supplies be surrendered at once. Elliot had little choice and capitulated, demanding all the opium traders surrender their stores to him, not Lynn. He then gave his word that the British government would reimburse the merchants for their losses, a promise he was not authorized to make. A very big mistake. Elliot soon was handed 20,000 chests of opium worth an estimated $20 million. Please note, real estimates were probably 12 million, but they, they said 20, they were probably fighting for more. So, on May 24th, 1839, Lynn believed that the British had surrendered all their stores and ordered all the merchants who engaged in the opium trade to leave China and never come back. They sailed out of Canton under the command of Captain Elliot himself. Lynn then dumped all the opium into pits and destroyed them. Now, an enraged Briton had reimbursement debt of $20 million to pay to their merchants, and the road to war had finally emerged. So just to recap, because I know this might actually be a little bit confusing, the major uh, reasons for why this situation occurred. Number one, China's overwhelming conviction sustained by over 4,000 years of historical memory, representing the pinnacle of civilization on the planet and believing all other nations to be simple barbarians who should not be dealt with as equals, but instead as only tribute bearers. This angered Western nations who felt they were equals, such as the British Empire. Number two, China's monopoly on the production of tea and to a lesser extent, porcelain and silk. Combine this with the insistence of being paid in only silver bullion. Britain became dependent and literally addicted to the tea. The bankrupt British began trading opium to China to meet their tea needs and the Chinese became addicted to opium. Number three, the emergence of the British Empire as being the most technological, dominant, industrialized power in the world broke the trade equilibrium. China fell into a major deficit and had to act in order to protect its nation. I really hope that you enjoyed this episode on the disaster that led to the Opium Wars. Can you please stay tuned next time for when we're going to learn finally about the first Opium War? And uh, if you haven't already, please subscribe, leave a like and or comment on other things you'd like to hear or see from this channel. I hope soon to also be providing um, some different content from the regular episodes. We're thinking about doing some book reviews because at this point, I believe I've read maybe somewhere in the ballpark of 30 books just to start off in the 19th century content I'm producing. And uh, perhaps I might even do a podcast with some fellow historians who've helped me out and, you know, just to talk about the subject matter. Anyways, this has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out.